I'm Jackie Pfeffer Merrill, Director of the Campus Free Expression Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, DC. I'm just delighted to welcome you to, to today's webinar from Banned Books to Democratic Disagreement, Courses on Free Expression. Today, we'll hear from three professors, each of whom has taught over several years an innovative course on some aspect of free expression. Their full bios are available on our event webpage, but I'll briefly introduce them right now. They are David Fine, General Counsel and Secretary to the Board of Trustees at Metro State University of Denver, Kathy Newman, Professor of English and Director of the Banned Books Project at Carnegie Mellon University, and Dave Primo, the Abri Annie and Mark Gabriellen Professor of Political Science and Business Administration at the University of Rochester. So you three, thanks very much for joining us today. Before I turn to our conversation about the innovative courses that they lead, I'm going to say just a little bit about the Bipartisan Policy Center, its Campus Free Expression Project, and our run of show. The Bipartisan Policy Center is a Washington, D.C. think tank that strives to bring the best ideas from both parties to promote security and opportunity for American families. We're the only organization registered in the District of Columbia that has the word bipartisan in its name, and that is a genuine challenge these days. And that's why, indeed, the Bipartisan Policy Center several years ago decided that it was a long-term mission play for the organization for us to do more to support colleges and universities in their essential work in teaching this generation of students the value of mutual respect, civil disagreement, learning to give a hearing to those with whom you dis disagree, and forge constructive compromises across principal disagreement. The Campus Free Expression Project's core work has been around the work of our Academic Leaders Task Force, which late last year released its report, Campus Free Expression, A New Roadmap. The report is a guide for campus leaders, and especially including uh, leader faculty as leaders, about ways to foster a free expression culture on their campus. It recommends that professors explicitly teach about free expression in their classrooms and as part of the course uh, objectives and content. That is why we were just delighted to bring together these three professors today to hear about how it is that they have uh, and why they put together whole courses on free expression, how it is that they've made them a success, and what they've learned about what college students today are thinking about freedom of expression. So today I'll have a moderated discussion amongst these three. We'll do that for about 35 minutes. Then I'll open it up to audience question and answer. And I encourage the audience at any point during our conversation to put a comment about what you're hearing or start asking your questions on Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live or using the live chat function on YouTube and Facebook. So uh, now for our conversation and uh, Dave Primo, I'm going to start with you. So you have uh, put together a course uh, that is built around the question, is consensus overrated? Um, so why a course around this question? From, from hearing from one another about what we're doing on these kinds of questions. So the, the motivation for me actually came from, as I think many good ideas on college campuses do, from students. Students who came to me, a couple of students who had never met before and said, you know, we, the two of us, like to have disagreements about politics. We're on opposite sides of the political spectrum. We don't think this goes on that much on college campuses. And we'd like to host an event focused on this question of why disagreements are so hard to have on college campuses. So we held the event at Alumni Weekend. It went really well. Uh, and it occurred to me that this would be something that would benefit all students to hear about. So actually having a course on the concept of disagreement and why we find it so difficult to disagree productively, and just as importantly, why it matters, right? Do we care about quality disagreements because it leads to better decisions? Do we care about quality disagreement because we worry about the coarsening of our lives or the coarsening of society? And so the course is structured around these kinds of debates and questions with a focus on th specifically on three spheres of our lives, the workplace, universities, and government, and, and slash politics. The reason I structured the course this way is to sort of give students the sense that disagreement is often studied in siloed ways. So we study disagreement on college campuses or disagreement in workplaces, but really there are a lot of common themes and threads and we can learn by taking a multidisciplinary approach to this question. So we read some 
some, some mill, but then we also read uh, some, some economics on these kinds of questions. And I think it provides students with a deeper understanding of this concept of disagreement and why we should care about disagreeing better. All right, well, I wanna come back to some of the uh, specifics in your course in, in just a few minutes, but uh, uh, Kathy Newman, I wanna to turn to you. So you teach uh, banned books and I understand you've been doing this for a couple decades. So what made you wanna teach uh, banned books for undergraduates? Um, yes, thank you so much. Uh, about 20 years ago, I had the idea for a class that would really show students how books are connected to politics in a very real world way. And so that was how I started teaching the class. And I used a lot of materials provided by the American Library Association. I feel like there's sort of like the secret uh, power behind the course because it's librarians who often field challenges and it's librarians who have collected the most data about those challenges. So um, over the course of those 20 years, I've, I've sort of developed an argument about um, librarians and Banned Books Week and how the history of Banned Books Week is uh, sort of a history of the, the public struggle over books um, over the last 40 years. Well, I'm going to come back to some of the specific uh, books and, and conversations that you've had in your class. Uh, but uh, David Fine, I, I want to turn to you. So you, uh, it's not just that you teach, you co-teach, and I want to, come, want to come back to your co-teacher as part of the conversation, a, a course that begins with the, the legal and, and philosophical uh, foundations of, of free speech and then turns to practice. So why this particular course? So yeah, speaking of my co-teacher, she is our president, Janine Davidson. Anyone listening in from the Washington, D.C. area may be familiar with her. Before she came to MSU Denver, she was the undersecretary of the Navy. So this is a subject that is near and dear to her heart for the same reasons it is to the Bipartisan Policy Center in that she believes this issue that we're talking about today is critical for a healthy democracy. And it's important to teach our students. The idea came to us from uh, reading about a professor in the Pacific Northwest, I can't remember which school we read about in the Chronicle of Higher Education, who did a course with his general counsel talking about current events. So we thought that was a great idea, but in putting the course together, I realized we needed to do more than that. And it ended up being a course around both free speech and the ability to speak freely. And so we uh, start off with a philosophical underpinning reading of the philosopher's John Stuart Mill, um, Aeropagitica by John Milton, et cetera, et cetera, and many popular writers in, in, in um, publications like the New York Times, the Atlantic, et cetera, moved through the um, early 20th century seminal First Amendment cases, and then, and then um, talk a lot about the issue of hate speech. Our school, so this is, MSU Denver is a regional comprehensive university. It's a majority minority school. Um, especially after uh, George Floyd, racial justice has become a huge issue. So the issue of the relationship between hate speech and freedom of speech is a, is a, is a big issue on our school. And, and, and this is a subject that's very important for us to talk about in the context of, 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 of free speech. And then we end up teaching the students not so much about banned books, but about what it's like to live in countries where there is, there is no protection for freedom of speech. We spend a lot of time on that. And then there's a multitude of, of issues that occur in this country and around the world day after day that provides fertile ground for us to talk about this issue as applied. For those of who are uh, faculty uh, listening in, I wanna offer as many specifics as, as possible for examples about how to, how to put these kind of classes together. So Kathy, I'd like to come back to you. Can you give us an example of a, of a book and how talking about how that book was was challenged or banned um, helps students have a conversation about what ideas can be expressed or not expressed in our, our polity? First, I just want to say how excited I was to see that David Fine was also teaching Aeropagetica. It's got quite a name, which the students struggled with. But uh, one of my colleagues, Christopher Warren, um, has studied this document and specifically the printer uh, who printed it was anonymous because he didn't want to get in trouble. And 
uh, uh, my colleague Chris Warren has identified the London printer who printed it using um, artificial intelligence and digital humanities techniques. So I'm super lucky to be able to bring Chris into my class and to talk about this document. So we talk a little bit about the First Amendment before the First Amendment, how sort of ideas about uh, freedom of speech, freedom to print and freedom to read have evolved over uh, many centuries. Um, but uh, I always start the class with two books. One is Handmaid's Tale and one is Grapes of Wrath. Uh, and Handmaid's Tale is evergreen. It's constantly being banned. And so the students can always see a current case in which it's being um, taken off the shelves or taken out of the curriculum. And Grapes of Wrath is a personal favorite because it's one of the few times when a book was taken out of a public library, the county library in Kern County, California, um, and uh, burnings of the book were staged in 1940. Um, so it's one of the few uh, kind of historic cases where we can look at a book banning and a book burning that is, is actually a little bit unusual, it's kind of not typical, but then we, we use that case to look at more typical cases and especially current cases. I have to say, I brought in my copy of Areopagitica. I thought, what a, what a delight um, to see this book, which is a real challenging, uh, you know, mid 17th century text that was on at the very beginning of, of both of your syllabi and um, uh, as a way to, to think about the foundations of, of freedom of expression. Uh, David, I would love to hear a little bit about why you also put that What's well, a tough text, I think, Yeah, um, at the start it, of the course. It's very tough. It's very tough to teach. I, I, I'll, I'll just issue a caveat here. I am not a constitutional scholar. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've been in public law for a lot of my life, so I know a little bit about constitutional law. I, I got the, I, the um, reference to Aeropagitica from reading Jill Lepore's book, These Truths, and she she uh, cited it, and that's, I think, where I, I learned about it, not, not, not otherwise. And um, figuring out how to teach it without having the students try to decipher it, which is very difficult, was, was one of the challenges. I was very happy to see that much of, on our syllabi, a lot of the primary sources that we use are similar. So that, that reassured me a little bit that I was in the right direction. And we used Jill Lepore's book also to talk about the free speech movement in, in Berkeley. She spends a lot of time on that and sort of how things have changed from, from that time in the 60s to the sort of to turn things around to the Milo Yiannopoulos visit, you know, more recently. So we spent a lot of time um, on, on history, on the history of uh, American history. So that's, but that's where I got the reference to Aeropagitica from. And then I had to A, figure out how to read it. And then if I didn't understand it, I would just read other sources who could explain it to me and then do the same thing with the students. Well, I want to, uh, the other thing that you do at the start of the course is a, a free speech survey, and I, I want to come back to that in just a moment, but uh, uh, Dave Primo, I want to turn to you. So you start with, with John Stuart Mill, um, but then you set the students up for a, a project of some sort about free speech or free expression, and I would just like to hear some more about what kinds of projects you've, you've seen students do and how, how that uh, fits into the course objectives. Sure. So my theory of teaching is that you, you, you don't want to put you want to put some structure on, on the requirements for a seminar course, but you also want to give students some freedom to explore the ideas that are important to them and in the mode that that works best for them. And so I've had a student, for instance, do a podcast on cancel culture rather than write a formal research paper. Now that podcast, the rule was, yes, you can do a podcast, but it still needs to be cited and sourced where you send me a site list separately. So the idea is a student is still doing the research, they're still putting together a coherent argument, but they're doing it perhaps in a more modern form. Um, other students have chosen to write op-eds as part of their course requirements. And so they, they write a set of op-eds on the questions of free expression. Again, the idea is this isn't just you giving your opinion, it is your opinion structured by research and structured by facts. And I argue to students that if you can write a tight argument in a thousand words, that's going to be a really valuable skill for your life. Perhaps one might argue more valuable than being able to write a 20 page research paper. Uh, and so some students have chosen to write op eds. Another student chose to host an event where he brought in speakers from different perspectives uh, in order to uh, fulfill the requirements of the project. So students have really stepped up and come up with some really creative ways to, to tackle this question of disagreement. 
Um, I want to come back to this question of the, the survey, because I think one of the things that's really of interest is what, what you learn about what students think about these questions. So uh, David, fine, you start and end the class with a, a survey. So I'm, you know, what, what are students asked in the survey and how do they, how do their views change over the course of the semester? Right, so the survey, I confess, I don't remember the source of the survey originally. The survey asked a bunch of questions um, around their ideas around freedom of speech, um, kind of basic questions. And it's essentially to test their ideas around what speech should, whether speech should be banned, whether there should be, for example, criminal penalties for certain kinds of speech, um, talks about um, uh, hate speech, et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting. And, and so we take the survey at the beginning of the class, talk about the survey before we get, before we launch into the subject matter. And then, um, take the same survey at the end of the class. What's interesting, what was interesting to me is I think the students who, who have taken this class so far have been relatively self-selecting and pretty thoughtful. Um, they, their, their answers to the survey are kind of in line of, of um, where I'd like them to end up by the end of the class. So, um, and, 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 and you sort of tally up where people are and it's not representative of, I think if you gave the survey across um, the American population in general, it would skew more towards the idea of, of banning certain speech um, versus not. But the students not so much don't so much take that approach. And certainly by the end of the class, um, to, ex to the extent um, I've indoctrinated them on, around these concepts of free speech and, and, and speaking freely, end up not too far off from, from where, where they started. I think the thing that I think about with, with this course is making sure I'm challenging my own notions around what I teach, are they, are they correct? Is, is this, or what we, we're talking about here, what the Bipartisan Policy Center is doing, this notion of, of tough disagreement and reaching, reaching towards the truth. Is that, is that really the way to go, go here? Should we be challenging those notions? And I'm not sure I've done a great job in that part of, of the class, but, but I think about that a lot. I want to remind all our, our viewers that you can go ahead and ask your questions on Twitter using the hashtag BBC Live or the chat on, on YouTube and, and Facebook questions or just uh, observations and comments about what you're hearing today. Um, so each, each of you uh, have a lot of uh, contemporary um, political references in your courses and, and Kathy, you know, banned books and controversial texts are certainly very front and center in the, in the news today. So. Um, you know, while you're starting back in the 17th century with Milton and earlier in the 20th century with, with Grapes of Wrath, um, how did the, all the controversies today get worked into the, the conversations? The students come to the class, I think, very similar to what David Fine was describing. They come kind of pre-selected. Um, they come as sort of defenders of uh, free speech or what they think free speech is. And that's why we start with the First Amendment, because I think people come into the class sometimes, they've all had civics in high school, but but they don't always remember that, that the First Amendment doesn't really guarantee you the right to say everything or anything. It, it's more about what the government can and cannot do. So, um, but then I think when we come to contemporary debates, the students are, are stereotyped that Gen Z as being very, very quick to cancel. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really try to distinguish between um, how uh, we try to distinguish between different kinds of um, books or forms of speech or Twitter posts that might uh, that might be getting canceled. And I think cancel culture, one of the problems with it is it tends to be um, a, a, a pot that we can throw everything in, but it's not very helpful in actually understanding who has power in a given situation and who has the power to stop somebody else from, uh, from reading something or expressing an opinion. Yeah. Um, I think this, you know, this whole question of what makes students feel safe and the concern about um, is does some speech, especially in the campus context, make make the campus unsafe for students? Um, is a concern that that sometimes students ex express on college campuses, and uh, when you that question comes up and you're as as your students are discussing that view, which 
Um, you know, we know that even though overwhelmingly students, um, only one in five will disagree with a statement. Um, some, you know, students should be exposed to all types of speech, even if some find it offensive. Um, there's some, a, a minority of students who are really willing to be censorious, uh, a quarter say we should, um, you know, prohibit speakers whose views might be biased, uh, one in six would not allow uh, distribution of pamphlets with a, a Christian message. Uh, one of one in five uh, would oppose a organization in a of, a of a group that was a pro gun rights group. So when you hear amongst your students or the students are talking about the view, some speech makes the campus unsafe. How does that get discussed by students? And what do what are what are the different things that they say with as their own responses to their peers? You know, I'll, I'm sorry, let me just jump in just because um, my, my, my colleagues here are, have great things to say. I, I will say that I have found that it's more administrators who are raised and some faculty who raise these concerns around safety, at least in my experience, more so than, than um, the students. Uh, I think the majority of students on this campus, at least, don't are, are fairly reasonable and fairly comfortable about talking about tough issues. There certainly are some students who raise who raise these questions. Some of them are student leaders. I'm although I'm convinced that if that group of students took this course, they would they would be able to see um, that these things can be discussed and in a in a in a safe way. I mean, I, they're not raising they're raising legitimate issues. And we teach uh, Charles Lawrence's book words that or article words that wound in our class. I happen to believe that there is harm from hate speech. The, the law does not, um, the law allows, or protects hate speech. Whether it should or not is a whole different question, but I believe there's merit to this argument that, that hate speech can, can harm people. But I think if you, if you get students together and talk this through, you can reach a, you can reach a point where, where you can talk about tough issues and, and e even recognizing that, that there may be some harm, but I believe from my experience, most students fall into a sort of a, a middle zone of, of, of being able to have these kinds of conversations. Yep, so I see Kathy nodding on this. I wanna come back to her in a moment, but Dave Primo, I, I think you two wanna chime in and, and maybe even also just talk about what does, what unsafe means in this context? What students yeah. seem to mean by unsafe? Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, I've, it's become clear to me in the last three years, just talking with last four to five years, actually just talking with students that there is a tremendous amount of self-censorship on college campuses, at least on this campus. And there's a couple of reasons for it, I think. Uh, one is, I think students, and I don't mean self-censorship on, you know, saying overtly racist things, right? Everybody would agree, like, there's certain things maybe you should keep to yourself. Uh, but I'm talking about being willing to actually have a conversation about difficult questions. Students are terrified of being ostracized from their social groups. And so there's this fear of being in the wrong peer group. And I think you really started seeing it when Donald Trump was elected. And being, being known as a Trump supporter on certain campuses, I think, would get you carved out of social groups. And you know, for, the, for, for most people who are listening, I suspect our, our college faculty or instructors, uh, I suspect that you also may know in your own neighborhoods people who are ostracized because they were uh, Trump supporters. And so there was this problem of students not being willing to engage with ideas because they were fearful of saying the wrong thing. And there's a second trend, and that is the trend of diversity, equity, and inclusion not being uh, integrated with concepts of free expression. Those two sets of organizations, if you will, to the extent there's any free speech infrastructure in a college campus, it's usually a separate, separate entity from diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we tell students, you're going to come to college, you're going to be on this campus, with, you're going to meet lots of different people. And then we don't tell them, oh, and by the way, it's actually difficult sometimes to interact with people who are different from you. And you actually need some experience and some training in this. And the DEI training that students get is just not equipped to teach students how to disagree productively and effectively. And so that's one thing that I've really noticed. And I actually added a whole week on diversity, equity, and inclusion in my disagreement class, because I think that's a real tension on college campuses. And I don't unfortunately see many college leaders who are willing to step up and deal with it. So any college leaders who are watching, this is an opportunity, I think, to be a leader by integrating conversations about free speech with conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, David, it might've been your, your syllabus. I saw a reference, or maybe Kathy Sigal Ben Parat's book, uh, Free Speech on Campus, which I use, and she she talks a lot about DE, the relationship between DEI 
and free speech and, and they can uh, they can relate with each other well and when we put our free speech free expression statement together i brought in our, our vice president for dei as, as a member of our task force and if you look at our statement it's it's got flavor more flavors of dei in it than i've seen from other schools and i totally agree with you that these things can work together and, and in fact frankly having a more diverse um group to have this discussion will lead to more fulsome and, and beneficial disagreement, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the questions that the task force took up uh, in with our academic leaders task force was exactly addressing this concern that students think, and the last polling from the Knight Foundation, that two thirds of students think that freedom of expression frequently or at least occasionally comes into conflict with diversity and inclusion goals. And how, how is it that campus leaders can make the case that these commitments are, are not only compatible, but on an inc you know, increasingly diverse college campuses that free expression is a pathway uh, to inclusion? Uh, but I wanna bring in on Kathy on this question. I saw you nodding about this question uh, um, concerns about campus being safe for, um, and I would love to hear about what you have to say about that. Well, I just wanted to explain that I take a slightly different approach to this when I teach about it. I'm, um, I try to stay away from feelings and opinions. Um, and I try to look more at policy and law, um, as well as, um, one of the things that I object to in a lot of mainstream media coverage of, uh, of college campuses is there's a real default to the anecdotal. There are of course surveys and, and polling and that kind of thing which is used and I appreciate uh, what David Fine does with that, with that method. Um, but I'm a little bit less worried about how students feel. And I'm more worried about, say, for example, the rise in the last five years, uh, incredible increase in really overtly racist incidents on campus, uh, swastikas, uh, nooses, uh, spray painting um, racial slurs. So that's something that I feel like is a little bit easier to um, uh, to note and categorize than uh, anecdotal stories about how students feel. Um, I, while I agree that I do think it is difficult for students to have the kind of disagreements that David Primo is talking about, um, I think that there's a mainstream obsession with fears about free speech on college campuses that I don't think uh, is, is equal in my mind to say the fact the number of states that are legally prohibiting the teaching of the 1619 project in K through 12 and public universities. So I'm, I'm really focused on um, looking at what people do more than what people say about how they feel. Yeah, I think Kathy, that's a, that's a great point around this notion of uh, cancel culture versus, versus true censorship, which, which I happen to agree with you is, is the real, is the scariest piece. And, and they're, they're related, obviously there, there are, free speech notions with both of these. But I do agree with you that the, the, the censorship uh, 1619 Project or other books around the country now to me is, 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 is to me an easy question um, constitutionally, but it it's sometimes takes a back seat to, to, the, to the quote unquote cancel culture issues that, that we, we read so much about. So I, I don't disagree with you. And I think that was one of the concerns in, in our task force. It was led by two governors and uh, governors Chris Gregoire of, of Washington and Governor Jim Douglas of, of Vermont. And they were strongly interested in, in having a message about campus free expression with campus leadership so that, um, that while there's many legitimate um, places for state governments to have oversight of public education, that this particular aspect of it, an academic freedom of freedom of expression, is is not for um, state house interference. I want to remind our viewers that they can ask questions, and I see some coming in. So I will I will bring a question from from Shannon Watson. I found that one of the biggest misconceptions about free speech is there isn't such a thing as consequence free speech. Does that come up in your classes? 
It, 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 it doesn't come up in our class. And I've seen, I've seen um, that issue raised a lot. I, I think that, that goes to, to what I, we try to talk about is the, the ability to speak freely, not so much about consequences, but just the ability to speak freely. And I think goes to what David was talking about in terms of self-censorship and whatnot. Yes, there are consequences to saying certain things that are unpopular or whatever. And I think that's true. But I think the, the real, I think just as dangerous honestly, as, as, as the banning of books is, is, is the notion of people not being, not feeling like they are free to say certain things. Yes, there are consequences. That doesn't, doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to create a culture where people are able to speak freely um, and have tough conversations, not be ostracized as David talks about. I mean, we sort of self uh, segregate in our, in our lives. I live in a neighborhood where, except for my neighbor who we get into fierce political fights like well, again in fierce political fights with because he's a uh, died in the wool fox news conservative but generally speaking the people in my neighborhood all kind of agree with each other so we sort of have self-segregated which is not necessarily a good thing that's happening across this country but i but i i do i do hear that argument a lot around yes there are consequences to to speaking freely and and, and that's just the way it is but i do think we it's important to cultivate a a world where, for example, I can, I can, I can duke it out with my neighbor and we're still friends afterwards. So I think, I think that's, that's what I'm sort of striving for. Others on the, uh, the difference between free speech and uh, consequence, free, con consequence, free speech or consequence, free speech. I mean, I, I just have a small historical point. Um, I think one thing that I don't know that I've seen mentioned is that cancel culture is in some ways akin to uh, the history of boycotting. Um, and this is something I've written about, published about, is, is uh, consumer boycotts. And what's sometimes not well known is that the history of the word boycott uh, dates back to a land league struggles in Ireland, uh, a ra radical tenants that were trying to change uh, their political and economic situation. And there was a British kind of overseer named Captain Boycott that they were protesting, they, they ostracized him. And his name then became attached to uh, this, this tradition that, that dates uh, to the present. And so um, I, 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 I think it's interesting that social ostracization uh, could be a consequence of certain kinds of speech. Um, and I understand uh, the argument that it shouldn't be, but I, I, the, the debate that makes sense to me is how do you, are, are we supposed to protect speech that denies the humanity of other people? Um, and so that's, that's where I see uh, really hard, uh, hard fights coming, uh, coming down around uh, what, what is protected and what is not. Uh, Dave Primo. Yeah, yeah. My my fear about self censorship and and this, I you know, I, I don't think anybody thinks that you know there's sh people shouldn't have a right to boycott, for instance, or something like that. But my concern is that college students, college is theoretically supposed to be a time to explore ideas, but if you live in constant fear of some social media post or somebody recording what you say in class and then posting it, and your life essentially being over as you know it in that particular moment in time as a college student. That strikes me as a really bad environment. And I worry that too many, that, that students uh, do, aren't free to express their perspectives because they're not quite sure what the zone of acceptability is because frankly, it changes and it changes quickly. Uh, sometimes it's hard for faculty to keep up. And to the extent then that you don't really know what the costs are, uh, you're gonna be risk averse if you're smart and you're not gonna speak up. And you get, uh, you, you get a, a set of college students who then go out into the workplace, ill-equipped to disagree and have productive conversations. And then you get what we're seeing in workplaces right now where, where there are a lot of conflicts over politics because nobody's ever learned how to disagree productively because we were basically, you're told, well, if you keep your mouth shut, you're not gonna get in trouble. So that's the safest route. Um, and sure, yes, again, we can find cases where there's overt racism. And, and you know, I'm not, I, I don't think it's productive to focus on those particular forms of speech, but I'm talking about a student who might raise a question about a contentious social issue. Try, a, think about abortion or LGBTQ rights and would be terrified to actually have a real conversation about that on a college campus for fear of being ostracized. And that to me sets a really bad tone for the rest of their life. 
So I, David, I agree with you. I, I think it's incumbent on, on uh, to, your, to your earlier point on university leadership to set a tone at the top that allows for this kind of culture and, 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 and discourages, you know, culture of ostracization. I mean, I went to, I'm dating myself, UW Medicine many, many years ago, and I was sort of, uh, and it was a little bit like it is to, like we're talking about today. I was sort of a, a right winger. And then I went to law school and all of a sudden I was a communist, right? So this but somehow or the other, I sort of, I sort of made it through. Was happy to have these these conversations with people who disagreed with me. But I, I'm not sure it's a, at least in my experience, it's a new phenomenon. But I do think it's important for the, for the to, for the university administrators and leadership to set a tone at the top to because students will take those cues, um, and, and then I, and I agree with you that it's important that they take that out into the, into their civic and professional life. It's, it's important for our country. I want to ask about how this, um, you know, this aspect of it gets institutionalized, especially with regard to uh, something that is appears both uh, on your syllabus, um, Dave Primo, with regard to the workplace, and, and David Fine. Also, you talk about the workplace. One of the things that uh, when one is wearing an administrator hat, whether it's general counsel or a dean of a department, is you know, defining what, what are the learning outcomes uh, that we want for our students and what is it that counts for success. And one of the things we know students come to college for is to get a job. We most hope that they come to college to read Milton, but we know that for many of them, it's really most about getting the job or a job. And um, is, is, this part of teaching these skills a, should it be and is it um, a, a learning objective that gets built into departmental learning outcomes, um, college-wide learning outcomes, so that it is a work, seen as a workplace readiness skill or a, a civic skill? I mean, one thing I just, want to jump in here on this topic because uh, I really follow uh, workplace free speech, uh, especially um, as someone who's following um, a lot of labor movement um, unionization uh, struggles right now. One thing that I am still frustrated about in this conversation is I think we're not talking enough about power. Mm -hmm. And I think when you move into the workplace, the person who has power over you is a boss. And sometimes, of course, you might have some power over a colleague. Um, but I'm interested in the freedom of speech of, say, Starbucks baristas who are trying to unionize right now and who are many of them are getting fired for trying to form a union in their uh, coffee shop. So I'm I'm frustrated with the discussion that doesn't focus as much on power. Who has it? College students don't have considerable power over each other. I mean, there is uh, there is the possibility of, of social media ostracization. Um, but it's not the same kind of power, in my opinion, as the power of a very large company, Amazon, Starbucks, to, uh, to limit the free speech and the right of, of free assembly through a union uh, of, of workers. Um, so that, that's a frustration I have but with the way that the free speech on campus debate plays out. Yeah. It's interesting, Kathy, your point around power. I mean, there's a lot, there are a number of people who would argue that power differentials uh, come into play in terms of free speech in general around issues of hate speech, who who the speakers are and the relative power between them and the people who are regulating the power. So I, I think you're right. I mean, I look at that issue that you raise more, I guess, from a legal perspective and, and certainly there are, and political perspective, there's there's always been a, a battle between unionization and, 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 and um, corporations in this country and certainly within Within the private sector, yes, when you're an employee you, you, in the private sector, you have far fewer rights um, of speech than, than you would it, um, in, in the public sector, et cetera. The way I look at it from, from, from this perspective, though, is to, it, this notion of creating or graduating students who are, are, are thinkers and are able to think critically and have these tough conversations. And I know, so for a lot of our students, or many of whom are first generation, getting a job is a really big deal. I, I would tell you the employers uh, tell us they're really looking for these kinds of soft skills that we're talking about here. So I do think there is a benefit to students coming out of a university, being able to think critically and, and, and whatnot, less, less so, but I, I, less so from the political perspective you're talking about, I'm thinking more in terms of just sort of the, you know, the, these, these quote unquote softer notions of, of engaging in civic dialogue. 
Yeah, I guess one of the, the questions that I have for, for all of you then is how, how is it that we, through these courses, or how is it that by you know, reading an, an author whose who's, who's book was, um, was banned or contested, or reading about these various cases kind of builds not just students' understanding of the, the philosophy and the, the legal structure, uh, behind freedom of expression and, um, you know, introduces them to a range of opinions about contemporary cases, but kind of builds their, their resilience and skills at finding their, their own way to the, the microphone, as it were, whether that's through um, political protest or, or activism of some sort, through their own writing, through, um, you know, all the ways that we can imagine people, once they graduate, using their their First Amendment freedoms and their other political freedoms to be active, engaged, responsible citizens um, who are kind of have the resilience when they have pushback and um, the, the courage, civic courage to disagree with others and the ability to to, to confidently express what they really think? Uh, I think that there, there's a couple of ways in which a course can do this. So one way is by structuring a, a course as a seminar where students have discussions and you lay the ground rules pretty clearly and you work on ground rules together as a class that students are gonna be free to speak their minds. Uh, and that, that will draw some students out. But I will be straightforward and honest that there are still students who will say to me privately, I wish I, I wanted to say this in class, but I didn't feel comfortable doing so. And I think that's a really difficult problem to overcome in the context of one class. There really has to be a culture on the campus that encourages free expression and the willingness to engage in ideas. And that's the sense in which I think it's, it, it's important to have a leadership that makes this a priority, that speaks out about this. Uh, and, and that's why I was getting to the point earlier of, of sort of connecting DEI and, and free inquiry kinds of questions, because I think if, it do, if, it doesn't, if, if the top doesn't make clear that free speech is a priority and that learning how to disagree productively is a priority, it's, it's going to be very difficult to change the campus culture. The second way a course can do this is to actually make it a mechanics course. In other words, you could actually structure the course around techniques for having productive and effective disagreements. And that's a different kind of course. Uh, and that's a course I've actually toyed with creating uh, next, uh, is a course where, where students basically workshop how to have productive disagreements, what are the steps, how can you make it work? And, and, it, and if, you know, if enough students take those kinds of courses, it can start to have an impact. I agree, David, I agree with you around rules of engagement. I think they're critical for the class. And frankly, for, for any group situation, our, our senior leadership team has our own rules of engagement for our meetings and, and they work, they work great. Yeah, I think uh, I, our uh, colleagues at Heterodox Academy, they have some sample language on their website about what, what, how, to, how to discuss that on a, on a syllabus as well as uh, a sample survey that a person can have for one's, uh, one's class about how people feel about these various topics. Yeah, and I like your idea, David, around mechanics, because some of this is you can create a culture through techniques of, uh, that people can take out with them into the world. So I think it's a great idea. I, a, I want to ask a question that's coming from uh, our Rochelle's son, who has asked a question about, you know, it's, it's all well and good for each of you to teach a class with a certain number of students, um, but, but is there any in -cap impact um, more broadly on the campus um, for a class like this? So students, you know, how is it we can make sure that these important lessons reach the, all students and how is it that having such a, you know, what's the impact of a class like this on the peers of your, of your students? I, I think David Primo has expressed well kind of the limitations of a single class mm -hmm. and, that, and David Fine has also talked about how these students are self-selecting. What we're noticing at Carnegie Mellon University is that the enrollment in the class keeps growing. So, and we keep trying to accommodate it. So um, we, we offer as many sections of the class as we need to right now to accommodate all the students. So I think one thing universities can do is offer these classes and then try to really uh, make sure there are enough 
instructors who can teach them. Um, I, I think that one thing I, I would say is that for people who are terribly worried about Generation Z, I'm a little bit biased. I'm a parent of three Gen Z teens, um, and I just adore this generation. I just find them so amazing to teach. Um, but I would ask people to sort of, you know, if people live in glass houses, don't throw stones. You know, I think a lot of the challenges to books are coming from uh, Gen X, uh, my particular gen generation, and uh, as well as uh, older um, baby boomers. So. Um, I think that there, there might be a concern about what's happening on college campuses, but again, I would really redirect people to where are the challenges to diverse books coming from right now, and they're coming from people in their 40s and 50s and older. So I, I, um, I understand why there's a concern about Gen Z, but I would defend them uh, to my dying breath uh, as really um, capacious, uh, excited, uh, kind of world-changing uh, generation. Yeah, I think the, the question that was just posed is, is, is a great question. I, that's, and I think you can only do so much with an individual class. That's why I think with the work that the Bipartisan Policy Center is doing around free expression and, and um, set, helps set the tone, helps us set the tone in universities, and I think it is a tone at the top kind of issue. And we've our, our president directed me to create a task force to create a free expression statement. And I think the tone she sets in the work we're doing here and the work we're going to do rolling it out does help um, <clears throat> set a tone on campus that goes beyond just teaching it in a class. Yes, teaching it in a class helps those students. Maybe they go out into the world and, and bit by bit they they they, they um, bring this message out there. So it's a great question, but I do think that's why the tone at the top at every university is huge. To, to, to make this work? So I've got two, two ideas to suggest. One, one is, is, to, is to consider whether to make, uh, to create a course that all, all first year students take, that small seminar course focused on the question of disagreement. And the idea behind that course would be that right from the beginning, students are immersed in, in, in learning how to have productive dialogues around difficult issues. Uh, and I think that if, if, it's, if it's a required course, and now that's tricky, right? I, I hesitate to impose yet another mandate on, on universities, right? But if it's, if it's designed well, right, it can be a course that actually sets the tone for what happens the next four years that a student's at a, at a, at a university. Uh, and I think that can be, could be really beneficial. The second is, in terms of what leaders can do in a concrete way, a university leadership can say to department chairs, can say to faculty, you know, we're not going to make you, you know, we're not going to add to your faculty activity reports a statement on disagreement, right? But again, I'm trying not to create more work here, but instead say to faculty, you know, you should be in department chairs, you need to be thinking about how your department fosters a culture of disagreement, fosters a culture of productive dialogue, whether it be in your courses and events that you hold. And that can be one way in which departments are evaluated or faculty are potentially evaluated, not not again in a, in a heavy handed way. So all carrots, no sticks is the way I would set this up. So that it's, it's, it's encouraged and it is highlighted that this is an important topic on par with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I go back to DEI because every university president talks about DEI, but they don't, they get the, they've, they're very big on the diversity part, but if you talk to students, the inclusion part is still sorely lacking. And that is in part because we're not equipped to talk with one another. Yeah, I think it's it's tough in a time when we yeah. there's so many examples of national discourse that is not um, doesn't model uh, respectful disagreements. Um, I want to come back to you, David Fine. You you, you have your co college president, President Davidson, uh, co-leading this class, and there, uh, you know, we had six terrific presidents on the Academic Leaders uh, Task Force who served, and there are other presidents who. Um, who are leaders on this, well, Michael Roth at, at Wesleyan or, or Ron Daniels at John Hopkins talks about this, a lot about these issues. But just in terms of having a president in the classroom and having as one of your modules on the role of the president on, on campus speech, um, uh, what comes up with the students in that, in that week in that module? Well, it's 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 huge, as you said, having someone. President Davidson is is a is a really a great leader, just per se. So students are very lucky to have her as the president of our school. But having her in the class, 
uh, with her wealth of experience and the things she's she's done in her life is huge for the students. Um, so, and I know I know not every I, I know Michael Roth a little bit. And not everyone is not every campus president is sort of a dynamic leader and engaged on this issue. But I think it it makes a huge dish, difference. I mean, at a school like Wesleyan in particular, which is uh, I know from personal experience, you know, the culture there having a president like that. I mean, he probably gets a little bit of grief uh, from his school, you know, getting out there on, on, on these issues. You need, having a, a leader like that come, stepping out is, is huge. And having our president uh, play a role in this class is, is you know, I feel, I feel very lucky. I mean, it's, it's probably why she selected me to be the general counsel, but it's, it's very nice to have a leader at a university setting the tone here. Um, it makes, you know, I'm interested in issues as well as makes my job issues easier. So, yeah, I think, I think, leadership is is huge here from from university presidents i want to encourage our, our audience again to submit questions uh bbc live is the uh, twitter handle or youtube and facebook a question from kathy deward about the the uh, place of campus speaker controversies uh in in these questions on college campuses so um you know one one might think that you know there when we have a campus speaker controversy that is is a actually kind of an unusual event on a college campus and what matters more is the day-to-day -day of what goes on in the classroom in the quad and in the dorms but these really shape um, in an outside ways um, the public's perception of of higher education and whether or not free uh, campuses are, are true homes to open inquiry and and how um, students and faculty themselves uh, see the see the climate for open inquiry on, on college campus. So um, Ms. DeWert asked specifically about the most recent controversy about um, Mike Pence at UVA, but just thinking in general, how do you see the discussion of guest speakers, whether it's speakers to the for whom the whole campus is invited or a speaker to a class how, how does that shape the climate for both the perception and the fact of viewpoint diversity and open inquiry yeah the question is is spot on and we teach campus uh speakers we speak teach disinvitation we, te we teach charles murray and you know we've and, and and what what we teach or what I teach and what I advise from a legal perspective, we're a public university, so we we can't discriminate based on viewpoint. In my view, is is to deal with controversial speakers by having people who are have a different point of view organize alternative speeches and making sure that both both forms of speech come off freely. Now, luckily, we have not been tested like like many other schools. Like Middlebury, I think Middlebury tried to do it right. They just didn't work out for them. Uh, you know, Berkeley was a disaster with Milo Yiannopoulos, which was you know his, his intended goal. We haven't tested these series, but we certainly teach it in class. And and the question, the, the person who raised the question is, is spot on because that's what resonates out to the world. They see a a controversial speaker being shut down, and 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 it and it reflects on all universities. And so I, I think I certainly have a viewpoint from a legal perspective and from a teaching perspective of how it should go. We luckily have not been tested with that question to see how we do. We have another question from Michael Murray um, about how it is that uh, the, the whole campus culture and the classroom culture affects these issues. So uh, Mr. Murray's question, how does the success of your course depend on broader norms of civility or incivility that govern social relationships on campus? And what can campus leaders do to shape those campus culture norms? I mean, I, I think David Primo answered that question really well. Um, I just wanted to give a very specific example of what happened in my class. Uh, we had a tenured professor in creative writing um, who was sort of called out uh, on an Instagram post uh, the summer of 2020. And um, questions were raised about, he was white, uh, questions were raised about a poem that he had written that used the N-word many times. Um, and uh, it, it created a big controversy within the English department. And so um, I ended up spending a week of the band books class talking about this issue. And I brought in people on various sides in this debate over what to do um, about this colleague of mine. Um, 
we brought the documents of the controversy into the class. And uh, I, you know, it sounds like th these are exactly the kinds of things that David Primo and David Fine are doing. I think I would, I would be surprised if there wasn't a college campus that hasn't had some of these uh, incidents. So I think that we can teach the conflicts that we're experiencing as we're experiencing them. And I think that's one way we can model uh, we don't have a lot of control over the leaders on our campus, but we can model as, as faculty and colleagues how to talk about these things um, amongst ourselves. Yeah, others want to come in on this question about uh, the, yeah, the, the culture, campus culture norms. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the campus culture norms affect your class because students are coming in with a set of expectations about what they can and they can't say. Um, and so I view it as a, as a as sort of a, a teaching victory when at the end of a course, a student says to me that they felt comfortable speaking in my class in ways that they hadn't in other classes. It means that I set the right tone for the classroom. And I think sometimes faculty members forget, going back to the, the idea of power relationships, that, the, that, that faculty members, there is a power relationship there because we ultimately evaluate students. And we need to be very mindful of the way in which we structure our interactions with students, both inside and outside the classroom, but especially inside the classroom. Because if you set the tone that certain topics are off limits or certain kinds of ideas are off limits, they're gonna pick up on that pretty quickly and you're gonna get uh, a certain set of results. But I, I agree with the premise of the question that uh, or, or the, the the nature of the question that yes we do we do in, inherit sort of the inv larger environment on the college campus and what we can do is try to change it one course at a time but ultimately there has to be a shift in, in campus culture. I, I totally agree and I think that the professor setting the tone makes a big difference. So, so for example, in, in our our school is I, I'd say most more of the students are sort of on the left side of the political perspective and we had we had in our first course we taught a couple of students who were libertarian slash slash to the right um and if you and and they were very vocal and happy to happy to they were not self-censoring they're happy to sort of pontificate around their ideas and and our response to them making them feel comfortable doing it and their student and the other students response to them engaging in a tough dialogue made a difference i also think from a academic freedom perspective students to your to your point uh david student views on these subjects are are protected by notions of academic freedom as much as professors are and i think professors need to realize that and so i think the professor setting the tone in the class is huge one one thing um jackie that you asked earlier is how do these classes help students find the microphone and i thought david primo gave some great examples of assignments from his class one of the things that we've built our class around is the students choosing a book um, the only restriction is it can't be a book that another student has already profiled, uh, but they can profile any book that's been banned basically at any time in history and write a little 500 word uh, uh, capsule biography of the banning of that book. And I think that uh, giving students an opportunity to choose their own adventure in terms of the assignment academically um, and I think one other thing that I've moved towards in all my classes is something called contract grading, where I basically tell the students, if you, um, if you meet these requirements, if you show up this many times, and if you complete this many pages or this many posts, that that's how you get an A in the class. So that students don't have a feeling that they're getting graded for their opinion. So that's something I've really tried to remove from the grading process. Right, and you will note you will note in certain reviews of professors because I see this come up when I'm dealing with the legal side of things. Students feeling like they are being graded based on on their opinion, and to the extent they are, that's 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 unfortunate in, in my view. Is not not appropriate either. Well, I uh, we have come already to the end of our hour together. I would just want to say, uh, uh, David Fine, Kathy Newman, Dave Primo, um, thank you all very much for um, sharing your both kind of positivity about students uh, today and the opportunities to have a, you know, to change campus culture uh, through the courses on freedom of expression and, and some aspect of it. I wanna thank our audience for tuning in today and for your questions that you've shared with us. I wanted to say, I know it's been a tough uh, two years on college campuses and that many of you on college campuses are seeing a, a post spring break uh, 
COVID spike. So just wishing all of you on college campuses the very best for the rest of the, the academic year. BPC's Academic Leaders Task Force report is available on our, our website at bipartisanpolicy.org. You can write to me uh, at uh, campus free, or free expression at bipartisanpolicy.org. And I would encourage you to subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. Some of you have asked in the chat about being, uh, being able to see some of these syllabi from these professors. We're glad to uh, make the connection. So again, just connect right to me at, at free.expression bipartisanpolicy.org. So to our panelists today, a hearty thanks to our audience. Thank you very much. And for those of you who are celebrating Passover or Easter, very best wishes for a joyous holiday. Thank you and good day. <laughs>